curve rain in near shore environments. So shall I give you, um, may I give you a little intro? Yeah, totally. Yeah, all right. Sorry about that. <laughs> Since you were so 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 good to do this, well, first of all, I wanted to start off by thanking our colleagues at NB5 Geospatial for supporting us and doing this brown bag presentation today, and uh, especially to welcome all those that are online and here in the in our conference room, and especially Andres Vargas from the NB5 Geospatial Corvallis, Oregon office, and uh, he has been with NB5 Geospatial for a five years in county and has uh, been a um, specialist there in uh, developing sensors for uh, topobathy, UAS acquisition and calibration methodologies. And we have some folks who have Florida roots. He's originally from Florida and is an engineering alumnus at the University of Florida. Um, and he got into the geospatial industry uh, working with sensor systems. And so uh, he has become an expert in airborne LIDAR. And at uh, NB5 Geospatial, he's helping them solve sensor problems and helping bridge the gap between acquisition and data processing and production. Uh, and he's from, from Florida. He's now enjoying, and he and his family are now enjoying living in Oregon and all of the great things that one can do in the, in the outdoors and, and exploring um, in the area. So we're <laughs> grateful that he would take the time to uh, share with us uh, some things that I think uh, I was explaining that we are particularly interested in uh, with a specialty in, in spatial data acquisition. So take it away, Andres. Yes, thanks so much for the introduction and having me here. Um, I'm really excited to talk about uh, topobathometric LIDAR, especially how it re relates to mapping near shore and riverine environments. Um, I'm gonna show you all the all the considerations to take and, and what this kind of technology can bring to the table. So, um, what is topobathymetric LIDAR? Um, topobathymetric LIDAR is LIDAR acquisition using an active sensor, the laser beam in this case. Uh, but what makes it topobathymetric is the fact that we can use a 532 nanometer wavelength, which is the green wavelength. And this wavelength interacts with the water in a sense that it can penetrate the water. NIR is absorbed at the very surface and the green waveform can penetrate the water. Um, looking at the waveform here, you can kind of see where the scan pattern is very explicitly different than the NIR scan pattern. And this is done on purpose to uh, better get that green laser wavelength to go into the water without reflecting off into space or blinding our receiver on the aircraft itself. Um, and what I mean by blinding is that we can oversaturate with that first return and not get any returns behind it because that first return is so bright. Uh, but it is a circular scan pattern such that it allows us to maintain that perfect 20 degrees angle into the water and really um, get good probability of that photon to return back to the aircraft. And that's bisected by the NIR wavelength. So we can also do a normal topo collection and uh, get the two data sets calibrated together to create a seamless um, point cloud. Now, I promised my coworkers I wouldn't get in too into the weeds about the waveforms, but I just wanted to give you guys a quick look at a waveform and what a waveform uh, for the green channel specifically looks like. And what we're looking at here is the outgoing pulse that you see in the transmit waveform, and then what the waveform looks like as it comes back to the aircraft. We send a very short pulse out of the aircraft and we, can, we have that characterized really well. And as we get it back, we get a return that's on the surface and we get an initial backscatter that we have to filter out through noise. And then finally, after we can get past that backscatter, we can then characterize different sets of returns in the point cloud itself or on the waveform itself. Well, within the, um, within the topobathymetric sensor world, we have two different uh, sensors that we like to use at NB5. Um, NB5 has the Regal 880G and then the Leica Chiopter as well. Uh, the 880G and the Chiopter are what are called shallow sensors, uh, shallow um, penetration sensors, and they have a higher pulse rate, but a little bit lower power. 
and a little bit narrower uh, beam divergence. And this allows us to get a lot more points on the ground and to create a much higher density data set. But as we want to get deeper into the water, we can sort of uh, utilize the other sensor that like has to offer. It's called a Hawkeye. And that one is a much wider, much more powerful laser that shoots at a much lower frequency, but it does perform much better at, at, deeper, at deeper ranges. Uh, so what is this gonna look like as we process the data? We're gonna create an NIR point cloud that is going to encompass all of the rocks, all of the vegetation, all of the hard surface returns that usually take place in a topo data set. Um, and that's going to be a multiple return data set because that also can use waveforms, but it can't penetrate the water. So we would be blinded by the water. In this case, we wouldn't get any returns. As we marry it with the green data set, we're able to bring in um, the green point cloud, which is going to be anything that is captured below that line that the NIR uh, can't see anymore. And with the marriage of these two data sets, we're able to create seamless uh, DEMs and seamless models um, to characterize the data for uh, the end customer. So why bathymetric LiDAR? We know that we can use um, sonar and multi-beam to get most of the conditions in the deeper realms. Um, but there's a point to where the, it's unsafe for the boats to get any shallower. And then some of the uh, robotic boats that they use, the UAVs, um, to, to collect these sonars, they would only be able to do profiles. So they wouldn't be able to get a good characterization just because uh, they have to kind of go back and forth in a very inefficient manner to capture the rest of the missing area. So this is where bathymetric LiDAR would really shine because bathymetric LiDAR on one spot is gonna encompass this entire region right up until where the sonar can pick up and hopefully there's a, a marriage of data between the two. I'll show some examples about that a little bit later, but this is, a, this is the area where we can really utilize bathymetric LiDAR as an additional tool to characterize um, and create a seamless model into you know, and open channels or riverine systems. Um, so there's a lot of collection considerations taken into account for flying topobathy. On top of what is already a regular topographic collection, um, topobathy itself is going to have an additional set of criteria that we want to um, follow to ensure best uh, collections from the green laser. Um, on top of already terrain and um, weather being an issue for flight, we also want to make sure that there's going to be good leaf off uh, considerations so that way we can get past the leaves and get any sort of water that may be underneath it over overhanging veg. Um, we also want to ensure that um, we have good conditions for water clarity and water clarity is going to be another important factor that we're going to study here uh, very carefully. But um, Again, it's gonna be another tool in the arsenal to use um, to complement with a bunch of other remote sensing technologies to create a really uh, high value and wealthy data set um, to provide a bunch of data. In this case here, we can show where the topo bathymetric LIDAR does shine. And you can see where we have all the topo on land to the left. There's a bunch of different technologies, topographic LIDAR, um, we have imagery, we have drones, they can collect right up until where the water um, begins. And then from there on out, topobathymetric LiDAR can create a very accurate transition between land and sea into the shallows. And then from there, where we start to be able to have the ability to bring in boats with multi-beam, they can create their data set and we can marry the three data sets together for a complete seamless coverage. I'm gonna go back to this slide to show a little bit about that with um, the additional sensors, but um, we can go back here into looking at the reasons for topobathymetric ladder that we've been alluding to this whole time. Um, traditional surveys in most of these areas involve transects uh, and it's gonna involve a lot of boots on the ground and it's gonna involve getting data on a single profile with kind of relative unknowns until the next profile. Uh, well, this has been traditionally a really good way to characterize some of these river systems. 
with topo bathymetric ladder, we can fill everything in between those transects in. And we can use those transects. We're not necessarily saying we need to replace them, but we can use them also in helping us characterize and check accuracy of, of the LIDAR itself. But now we have an entire volume that we can create with uh, a seamless DEM between those two profiles. Including that, we want to talk also about safety where, um, you know, it's been um, an issue where it's hard to tell with some of these rocky systems or rocky project areas that we need to acquire data, uh, whether or not a boat can get in safely without, you know, any sort of damage to the vessel or personnel. So this is where, um, you know, LIDAR, especially the LIDAR that starts to get a little bit of into the deeper channel and really give boats a lot of room. Um, it starts to become very beneficial to um, marrying the two data sets together for a safe acquisition on a sonar survey as well. Um, moving on, what are other limitations of topobathy? So with topobathy, we have to work with really clear data sets, um, data sets with low turbidity, and we're going to get measurements for uh, how clear the water is using Secchi depth and then also turbidity readers. Uh, and we can also bring in other sensors and other sort of monitoring into some of our planning characteristics uh, that I'll talk about that in a little bit. But not just to mention with turbidity, um, we also have issues penetrating uh, with highly aerated waters or, or um, the rapids, if you will. Uh, that white water and aerated water becomes very difficult to see through for the laser beam. And then also heavy aquatic vegetation and sometimes very low reflectivity returns or reflectivity surfaces underwater, which some of that could be due to the veg. Uh, a lot of that stuff will create um, returns on the bottom that aren't necessarily indicative of the bottom, but could also be a very um, thick field of seagrass where we have a thick bottom profile. And I can go into that a little bit more in depth, uh, but the, that kind of makes it really hard to understand where the bottom is and we have to kind of get through that vegetation. Um, so this is ideal for a collection. This is one of the collections we got to do out in the Florida Keys. And you can see that we get a great profile out to extinction. Um, but then sometimes in some of the conditions where we're trying to transition into bays or, or deltas or, um, areas where there's an influx of brackish water, you can kind of see in the water column, there's a lot of suspended sediment. And this suspended sediment becomes very uh, difficult for, the LIDAR can't see through it. So here's a good example in this photo of where we have relatively clear water where we can kind of see some bottom returns up until we hit a sediment plume that would completely blind us on the, that portion of the flight. So uh, planning for all of these conditions is very important. Um, and it's something that we monitor and take very seriously in order to give the LIDAR the best chance uh, or the project the best chance for acquisition. So how do we understand how deep these systems can go? Um, these systems have uh, previously been characterized what's called SECI, uh, SECI depth measurement. And it's really a, what Seki depth is, is a, a disc that you see there on the left and you basically lower it until you can't see it anymore. And once you can't see it anymore, that's the measure of one Seki in that water body. And then uh, the lasers use, um, it could be defined by um, how, what factor of depth past the Seki reading, uh, you know, the laser can see. So if we can see an example of about two meters on a Secchi disc, we can get with a 1.6 factor of depth penetration, we can get up to 1.6 at distance. So roughly over three meters. Um, but here's uh, what the K value is for different types of um, different types of water. For example, drinking water would be 0 0.006, and that's incredibly clear water. And I'm going to have an example of that in a little bit. But in this case here, you can see where we're doing some of our monitoring off of the side of a, of a pier where that second desk disc is going. And 
the second disc is a really good infield measurement of how clear the water is just to kind of give us a ballpark idea of how deep we're going to penetrate. But we also take readings using NTU measurements. And we'll take a device where we will put it in, into the water and actually measure the clarity of the water with its suspended sediment and um, whatever uh, other algal debris or whatever might be in the water to change the clarity. And we can actually get a K value from that. And we've kind of been tracking how that matches with Seki. Um, and we'll monitor these over time, just to understand when in time is going to be the best conditions to go fly. In riverine, in riverine environments, it can change based off of seasons. Um, you know, you have high flow rates that usually will have clear waters in the springs, or you'll have really low flow rates uh, where kind of the sediments start to get picked up in the summer. So we have to plan around those. And those are seasonal changes versus you have tidal changes on the coast um, where you'll have incoming tides or outgoing tides, depending on whether or not they're bringing um, yeah, sediments into the project area. So you have to monitor for those as well. I'll have some examples of that in a little bit, but this is an example of possibly the best um, reading we've ever had for our NTU meter. And you can see, you know, the water is pristine, crystal clear. And it's so clear, in fact, we'll actually have a little bit of a hard time figuring out where the water surface is. So we have to um, very accurately measure uh, on the sides what the water can, uh, where the wetted edge points are uh, as, as a starter, and then also really focus on NIR and where we have extinction on NIR to get a, a water surface that spans across. But it's important to understand where that water surface is so we can accurately refract the data. So going into operational considerations, um, we use other forms of understanding when is a good time to go fly uh, that complement in, in field measurements. And we're also looking at tides and we're looking at, um, we're looking at also wave, uh, wave heights and everything because that's going to under, uh, help us understand how much aeration is going to be in the water, especially towards like beach environments. And then also as we get to high and low tides, if we acquire on the low tide that's clean, we're going to get a much deeper um, possibility of getting returns and a much higher chance that we're going to have more overlap with sonar. So we're constantly monitoring these tide windows and trying to aim for the uh, falling uh, edge of the tide as well as checking for clarity in the water. And then also we can have a day where all the water conditions are great, but then we'll have uh, problems with low lying fog or weather. So in this case here, we had a perfectly bluebird day where we're able to go out and acquire data, but then we had the incoming fog that would be under the aircraft flying height and this would completely wash us out for this day. Uh, this was a particular collection that took place in Alaska. And this collection here, you know, we're, we're checking the daily precipitation where it's as low as we can get it so we're not flying in rain. But we also have to work with cloud cover. So we're monitoring which days of the year and under what times we can actually go and acquire data, including acquiring data during daylight so we can use our imagery because these sensors are not flown by themselves. They're usually flown with a myriad of other sensors. So we're monitoring all of these conditions um, all the time just to understand. And we're also looking at these historical charts just to understand when is the best targeted window to acquire data. And an example here of where we could get really, um, we were really disadvantaged by turbidity. Um, on June 7th here, the flight to the left, you can see that we have really, bad water clarity. It's very clear that there is sediment in the in the water and you can see that there's a hard wall uh, on that lower picture where the sediment is just kind of like in a plume. Um, and we realized that this was whenever the wind was blowing from the southeast and we started kind of tracking even wind direction for this particular flight and we retargeted when we noticed that the wind was blowing from a different direction and these this same area as you see on the left um, the plumes subsided quite a bit. They, they went into another direction and really gave us a clear chance at getting the best bathymetry um, 
uh, collection in this area. And so you can see an example of that here. Um, the cross section that's in pink on the bottom is that day that had the suspended plume and we didn't get much deeper um, than all that suspended plume. And we left all that bathymetry uh, without acquisition. So when we retargeted the flight, when it was much clearer, our sensors performed much better and we were able to get much deeper to a point that we were able to get 10 meters. So um, my animation isn't working, but we were, were able to create the DEM that you see on the, on the right there based off of the point cloud we collected on that second day. So the depth performance was much better and we were able to get a lot more out of that data. Another thing to look for is we'd like to plan our um, acquisitions using other tools that are provided. So we can look at satellite imagery um, um, for turbidity, no, uh, no broadcast, um, this tool that we're able to check turbidity on the coastline when we try to acquire in the Chesapeake area. Uh, and here you can kind of see, let's see if I can get it to play. You can kind of see how the conditions are changing and the what is called the K490 band. Um, that's what we're gonna be monitoring. That's what's gonna give us the suspended plumes of debris. And we are able to focus on when is a good, a good time to go fly there. And this was actually a difference between two events that took place where we focus our data acquisition where um, the turbidity was the lowest uh, that we had there, um, 2.5 NTU. And then we try to beat a storm that hit that area. And once that storm hit, this area had a hard time um, dropping back down in, in turbidity, as you can see in this chart. So af after that storm event took place, we were basically washed out of that area for a while. And we had to let the sediment settle. So we're using a myriad of different tools to go out there and, and really understand when is the best time to go acquire data. Uh, going back to the waveform processing here, um, now that we've acquired data, we can transition over to production and calibration. Um, and the production workflows, the way they work is we'll get the data in-house from the uh, acquisition. We will process all the trajectories and extract the data just like you would a normal topo collect, but now we have to focus on refraction. And uh, depending on the sensor that you use, you can focus refraction on the front end, where as you're creating the point cloud, you're getting refracted data, or we can handle the refraction ourselves based off of where we see the water surface in the point cloud. But this is an example of the waveform where you're getting different types of returns uh, and how well the sensors perform in these areas. An area where you get a good return, uh, that top right corner, um, you'll see that you'll get a really bright return that is on that, um, on that dotted yellow line at the top. And on the left there, that blue line is where the sensor itself measured the water surface. So in this case here, we have a hard time seeing that water surface return based off of how bright it is on the bottom. Um, the picture just below that shows that we actually have a really bright water surface return there in brown. And then the next two returns are going to be bottom returns that are of a more typical bathymetric bottom return. Uh, and then finally, a return where we have a lot of noise in the water column. You can kind of see that after that initial first return there on the, we're, we're looking at the left waveform here, that initial return there, um, you start to get a lot of suspended sediment in that water column, but then you're able to still see a little bit of that ground return there in the dotted yellow line. Uh, and this kind of shows you that we have to work really hard to filter out some of those returns in the water column to be able to get to those bottom returns. Uh, so this particular technology of topobath, uh, topobathy has a lot of signal processing involved in it where, you know, there's always constantly refinements from the manufacturers on how to interpolate returns and how to get um, you know, additional performance out of these systems. But now that we have processed the normal topo topographic data set, so with the NRR channel, now we have to worry about refraction because where we measure these points, it's not where the point actually is. As we transition between the media, so between air and water, that changes based off of Snell's law. Um, 
And that characterizes really well where that final return is gonna be. As it transitions into the water, it changes angle and then it also changes the speed of light, essentially giving us a new position. So on the right there, you can kind of see uh, where the laser pointer would be shining the light, but since it refracted on the water, it's actually in a different position. And we have to account for that for all the bathymetric points in order to get accurate points underwater. So the refraction step for topobathymetric processing is a very important step um, that can take place and be checked in a couple of different areas. But in this particular case, we're doing a refraction correction based off of where we feel the water surface is. And then we are uh, calibrating those points after the fact. Um, and here you can kind of see an example of refraction correction at work. The tan colors or the, um, the brown colors there, those are what the original point cloud would be from the aircraft extracted out. Um, this is, uh, and not corrected for its path in the water. But once we're able to apply refraction correction, we get that new profile where it's moved up a little bit and uh, we remove a lot of the noise and inconsistencies from the water column. So how accurate is it? Going back to what we we're talking about with the other data set, we are able to take transects as we're acquiring some of these sites. So our ground, our ground crew, when they go out to a project site, they typically just collect control for a normal topo project. But as we go into topo bathymetric projects, um, now we have the additional ability to collect control points in transects into the water. And we can use that to check how well we did in refraction and how well things are calibrated um, in general. So here you can kind of see, we took a transect across these two uh, water bodies. Um, these RTK points were taken. These are actually physically bathymetric uh, or, or um, yeah, we call them bathic control points. Uh, we can also take some of these along what's called the wetted edge. So we understand where that line between topo and bathymetry takes place. It's really shallow and it's really kind of hard to tell a transition area, but we'll take some points along there just so we can be informed in the in the point cloud where the break line should be and where to expect that transition into refracted points. Um, and then after we calibrate the data using normal best practices for topo bath, uh, for topo uh, LIDAR acquisition, we can then go back and use the bathic control points to check where those points end up. And um, we end up finding very good marriage between the point cloud um, as we take some of these transects. So it's another level of accuracy assessment that we can do. For this particular project, um, you can kind of see here that we took a couple of, um, a couple of points along the profile on the edges of the water. And then we also took um, we, uh, bathy control points in the triangle uh, locations. And this is kind of talking about the difference in absolute accuracy from different types of refraction regimens that we have. One of them would be using the NIR points for refraction. The other one would be using green points where the green sees the water surface as refraction. And then finally, where we have extinction of both of those on the water surface, and we have to create some synthetic points. Here we can kind of see how those different um, water surface uh, identification and then refraction from that water surface changes the accuracy on those bathymetric points. So um, there's a lot of factors at play when trying to understand how to refract the data. And this kind of shows you, you know, you want to have good returns in NIR um, and then also try to use the green when you can and or create synthetic water points to do refraction. Uh, from that area. So um, here we're going to look at, uh, so this is going to be an example of how our data sets get married together. So in this case here, we've maxed out or masked out our topo, uh, just the topo data. So here we're able to see what the NIR creates as far as the dem goes. And then we're able to kind of show uh, what the bathymetric points create as far as DEM and how much more information it gives us within the rivering system in this case here. And then since we were able to have um, 
all of the point cloud in general, we're able to also superimpose what vegetation would be. And we can kind of see the areas that have vegetation in this data set. And then we're able to kind of see how the point clouds interact themselves. So taking a transect, which is what uh, we would previously be um, just collecting for this river, you can kind of see where the bathymetric points uh, kind of meet up with uh, the water surface. And then also the, the, topo, uh, the topo points here in red, and then all the additional points in the vegetation and default class um, that aren't hard surface returns, but are also in the, in the LiDAR point cloud. And then finally, in this case here, we are um, looking at how we perform with wetted edge and bathy submerged points uh, and how uh, roughly how many we take on typical projects. When you're looking at projects in general, you are um, you are marrying the data between several types of um, several types of data sets, but we're also taking different size projects, and the number of wetted edge points and the number of bathymetric points will change <clears throat> depending on the size of the AOI. <coughs> Excuse me, depending on the size of the AOI. So. We will go and usually do a collection and then our survey control will go out there and get us a bunch of points uh, and they'll divide them into different types of points that we can use to check the data sets. And after all of our calibration processes, we have found that um, the data, calibrating the data and then testing the data to all of our control does end up being uh, pretty tight. Uh, what's interesting about this project here is that we're able to also bring in um, you know, sonars uh, that are acquired from some of these areas. And this is a perfect area that I'd like to highlight because from these docs, we can take our SECI depth readings. We can also drop in our uh, turbidity meters and we can have those um, during the time of collect and then also leave them before for a certain amount of time just so we get an understanding of what conditions are gonna be like uh, across time and then focus our acquisition during a perfect window. So our, our field crews will actually try to find docs like this and actually put a lot of uh, instruments in the water to help us understand the area we're, we're trying to map. And then also during mapping um, of how well, you know, we hit that targeted window. Uh, and then, you know, this is from some of our sonar folks who would actually go out and acquire data on these, uh, or launch from these boat docks just to go fill the voids that we had. So what do products usually look like for our topobathymetric data sets? Uh, well, from the point clouds, or what we deliver typically is gonna be point clouds. It's gonna be classified point clouds with the ability to provide the customer with all the waveforms. A lot of the times with these waveform systems, um, we'll find that the people requesting it are well informed and they like to do a lot of data processing and signal processing themselves just to see if they can get additional performance. So we like to provide them that waveform uh, so they're able to get additional, maybe a little bit additional depth or maybe understand a little bit what the turbidity is looking like or even do some sort of vegetation analysis. Um, then we also provide some raster models, which is going to be the topobathymetric bare earth that married bare earth between uh, the green laser and the NIR. Um, each sensor also is able to give us intensity images. Now, intensity images is kind of difficult because we have to do quite a bit of normalization and it depends on the type of normalization that we do, but um, you can get a good understanding of how that wavelength, uh, you know, gives you a completely independent raster for 1064, which is our usual NIR. Uh, laser uh, wavelength versus 532, which is the green laser wavelength. Uh, and each of those could be used for additional information for the end customer. Um, the surface models are, are important. And then also we provide a total, uh, total propagated uncertainty estimate. And that total propagated uncertainty takes in all of the parameters from the sensors, uh, including the navigation devices, so IMU, GPS, the inherent error of the sensors, its footprint, its laser uh, pulse length, 
uh, and a bunch of different things. And it creates a error model of how accurate different portions of the data are. Uh, this is an important product, especially for clients like NOAA. Um, they've de developed a tool to help calculate some of that, and we provide them those figures, but they're able to lean on that to understand what portions of the data set would be of higher risk or not uh, to create some of their um, final charts. And then finally for vectors, um, here we're able to really lean into the data to give water edge delineation or break lines, uh, void areas where we know that um, these are the areas where topopathy was not able to penetrate to the bottom and we got extinction. Uh, and these void areas is where we can give a file then to somebody doing the sonar surveys and they can go and uh, just try to get sonar in those areas. And then finally contours, which uh, is a standard product for topo, but we can extend that into the bathymetric point cloud as well. So let's talk about normalized intensity. Um, the intensity images are very interesting because not only are we trying to normalize for flight in the air and angle of the, the angle of the laser on the ground, um, all those play it into effect into the amplitude of the pulse coming back. So we can normalize across all of that for topo, but then once we get into the river environments, things like clarity take into effect, uh, also things like depth take into effect. So a lot of the raw point clouds that we get, especially transitioning between a shallow and a deep channel, here you can kind of see where you have your, you can see where the ground is based off of the image, but then you have the intensity of the shallow channel, which gets dark really quickly. And then the deep channel picks up and it's a very bright return that goes into, uh, you know, a little bit more, um, a little bit more information as it gets deeper, but then it also falls off into extinction. And we have to get those two data sets to agree. And it's, it's, a, it's rather difficult because you have to understand the angle of the pulse going into the water, how deep it went. It's not a linear, uh, difference as it goes deeper. Um, so there's a lot of factors in play. And so here you can kind of see what the, uh, for the Leica system specifically, we have the Chiopter, which is a shallow channel, the Hawkeye, which is a deep channel and their corresponding intensity images. And when you superimpose the two together, you can kind of see where there would be a very huge difference. And then also when the Hawkeye is blown out, we don't have enough information from the Chiopter to resolve some of those areas. So we do a normalization based off of um, depth and angle into the water. And we get the, this image here, which is the two superimposed of each other. And then after that, we want to normalize the two channels together and we can create this intensity image. And finally, this is the intensity image that we would provide the, the customer. And then they're able to take this image and understand the type of, um, the type of, return that the particular point had. Uh, so in, these, in this case here, we can have a really bright sandy area, which is its higher intensity. And then we can go off into a little bit more of a vegetated or rocky environment as the intensity drops. So this is gonna be useful for understanding what's going on underwater. Uh, so here you can see the raw intensity images as it comes off of the two sensors. And then finally, normalized for depth, range, and color balance. Um, and uh, it, it takes a little bit of uh, effort to, to create these. Uh, and it does differ because as you can see in the image on the left, you have flight line, um, flight line artifacts in the raw intensity image. So, uh, you know, again, it, it it's quite a bit of tuning to get it to this image on the, on the right. And then finally going back to where Tobobathy um, becomes a tool in the remote sensing arsenal to acquire these areas. We can look at thermal and we can look at multispectral imagery and other um, types of remote sensing sensors to get a wealth of information on top of what, you know, the very accurate point cloud does get. In this particular example here, we can look at, uh, you know, our um, hyperspectral and how it's able to get information based off of the flows of a certain river and then understand where uh, the temperature drops off based off of depth 
And, you know, this is a point that could be very uh, important for the study of this particular region. Maybe there's a, you know, a spring introduced here. Or we're trying to solve for other um, considerations for the end client. And this is just another sensor that we can incorporate uh, or, or tie into the point cloud, uh, you know, as a, an additional feature to add to the point cloud as, um, as a value. And then here's an example of LiDAR and sonar integration to where, you know, we have this region of river, this is actual polarized point cloud. So we took the RGB from the camera, appended it to each point in the point cloud, and we're able to kind of show where we have bathymetry. And this is where the laser was able to get bottom returns and where we understand that we have extinction. And based off of this void, we're able to provide that for the sonar and they're able to target these particular areas and superimpose their data into our point cloud. And now we have a seamless transition between the point cloud. Um, within MB5, we have um, a sonar arm um, and they are basically more coastal, but they do a lot of projects with us where we're working closely with them to figure out where we have voids on, uh, off on the coast. And they target those areas with their collections and with their multi-beam and um, regular sonar. But then this, in this particular case, it could also be um, acquired using the autonomous boats. Um, there's a lot of small UAS or UAV solutions um, to, with sonar involved that can be used to fill in these patches. And then finally, what else do we use these applications for? Um, there's going to be a lot of different types of uses for this, but you know, we're going to be looking at broad coastal areas where NOAA is going to be creating some of their charts. Uh, there's going to be also marine resource management where we can take what we understand to be vegetation or some of those intensity images, and they can use that to understand where there's, um, you know, certain types of vegetation in certain areas. Storm surge modeling, uh, I have a good example of that here in a little bit. Um, and then shoreline mapping nautical charts, as well as uh, the benthic feature characterization is a little bit trickier, but it is, it is in, incorporated with some of the use of the point cloud and the intensity image as well. Um, so in this one, we have uh, stream attributes and habitat management and restoration. This project specifically looks at um, the intensity images as well as some of the morphology that's taking place from the DEM and assigning uh, you know, certain types of um, character, characteristics to areas uh, that would promote habitat, uh, pool habitat, sorry, for, for some of the fisheries and whatnot. Um, but again, some of this characterization from the wood, uh, from the point cloud itself is going to be very useful. Uh, the point cloud has a density to support understanding if we have woody debris or we have smooth um, models or just pits in the water. So it's, it's really good for helping understand where some of these areas could take place. Um, this is built so far downstream of the point cloud that it's really working and leaning off of some of the intensity images and raster products, but it is something that is available in some of the studies that take place with uh, topographic collections or topobathymetric collections. Now, going back to the point cloud, um, the point cloud has such a high density in some cases that we're able to actually pick out individual features. And in this case, on the left here, we have a highest hit model that's showing us uh, not only that, you know, we have this channel here where we're getting the top return of the water, but within that water itself, we have a bunch of downed trees. And if we look at the point cloud itself, we're able to identify these trees and add a classification to that that could be used later in a raster product for other product generation. Um, but the density in these topographic or topobathymetric collections supports being able to see features like this in the water. Um, moving on to floodplain uh, modeling. Here you can kind of see that we are um, acquiring and calibrating the data enough to where you're able to 
understand how things have changed in the water and then also create such a uh, accurate model that hydrology can be uh, really well thought out. Uh, in this case here, um, we're looking at several regions that are um, used to kind of increase that water level and, and do some other um, hydrology products to understand what flooding would look like. Uh, here, I'm gonna play this clip here to kind of show in that particular region as, let me do it here. As you start to bring up the water surface to water level, uh, the normal surface, and then bring it up in quarter meter um, increments. And as you start to increase the water surface, you start to see that that field on the upper corner, upper left, starts to flood. Uh, and then you can also see legacy oxbows in the river and how things have changed over time. But um, this is very useful, having such an accurate data set to what the flood plains are going to look like and how, how floods would take place in these areas. Um, here we can also talk a little bit about change detection. Uh, when you collect a data set, you're creating a calibrated data set, you're tightening it to control, and you're getting the highest accuracy out of the data set possible, but then we can also target collection of the same area over time and comparing the DEMs to each other. When you compare the DEMs to each other, we can start to kind of see where there is negative versus positive change and what the channel has done over time. This is a particular project in uh, Washington. Um, but here on the right, I'd like to highlight just how much change has taken place between the two data sets. Um, and this is, again, we're targeting for a collection on low flow, but once you have the bare DM, you can kind of uh, figure out where you want your uh, water surface to be and then do a comparison between, you know, the different years and how much land or volume has changed between these two data sets. Um, a very tough example of some of this change detection would be on braided rivers like this Niagara River here. Uh, we have another river in Nebraska called the Platte River, which um, we're acquiring once a year and we've been doing it now since uh, now about seven or eight years. Uh, and we're creating a data set that's uh, basically calibrated to one particular data set so we can really extract that performance and that change uh, between the data sets. So um, this is just an example of how complicated it can get. Um, then finally, for, in for infrastructure planning, uh, we're able to use topo, bath uh, topo bathymetric data sets and marry them with sonar data enough to be able to characterize where is the best place to, you know, locate the structures to support the bridge or uh, just to see kind of like the health of the bridge over time or also understand what putting a dam uh, into a certain area would, would be like. Um, so there's a, a lot that can go in towards using uh, our normal raster and point cloud products to planning for some of these designs. Then also volumetric analysis. Um, we're looking at here, um, a reservoir that is topo bathymetric data set superimposed with sonar. And that marriage of data allows us to create a point cloud that they can use to run analysis based off of how much water it can hold and how much energy could potentially be built up here. Um, this is just um, two examples that kind of really highlight how, how wealthy this data could be. And then finally, NOAA's coastal mapping program, which is uh, in our office, one of the main um, main clients of ours, where we're providing them data to create some of their charts, and we're trying to give them data where they're able to accurately plan and design and show the changes year to year between their charts and some of the products that they're creating. Um, and they've worked with us very closely to create products like the TPU to really understand uh, the accuracy and air propagated into the point cloud. So they have a feel for where they can actually um, understand that there has been a significant change.
Um, but it's part of uh, NOAA's coastal mapping program to keep updating these charts and keep these up to date so that way safe navigation around these areas can take place and they can accurately also track um, natural disasters like hurricanes and storms and show the changes immediately after and keep everything as up to date as possible. Um, included in here, you know, some of the things we were talking about earlier where they're updating their navigation and riverine floodplains, uh, as well as also helping create some of these digital shoreline analysis um, products off the point cloud itself. Um, a lot of these coastal resiliency and coastal um, analysis products that are, people are driving are based off of transects that are created with uh, sonar and transitioning right onto the dune itself. And with a point cloud as wealthy as a topo, uh, topobathometric point cloud, you're able to have an entire surface of where you can then model these transects from the data instead of actually having boots on the ground and create this product a lot faster and repeat it much more frequently and then have a, you know, a constant changing analysis for where the shoreline is receding or, or growing out. Um, finally, NOAA has a couple of other products. Um, the sea level affecting marsh model, model where they're uh, constantly tracking um, some of these wetlands and how things are changing there, as well as V data. Um, and some of our topobathometric products to them go into these uh, uh, products that they provide. And then finally here we are looking at um, how well, this is a, this is more of a topographic, uh, topographic only product where we're scanning, um, scanning mountain ranges over time, just to understand how much snow is on there. And, uh, from there we're able to, you know, take a summer collection and then a winter collection at different points in time, just to understand how much snow is on there and provide a product to add that estimates how much water the, um, you know, the corresponding basins and then cities are going to have for the next year. But um, this one kind of ties in a little bit towards the topobathometric side of things as we start to study, you know, the downstream effects of some of the water that's coming down from there. Uh, and then finally, the 3D hydrology. So this 3D hydrology is usually, um, it could be planned off of our data sets, but it's also supplemented with um, some satellite drive bathymetry and then satellite products. And, you know, with some of these models, we're able to understand with the um, hydrography and, uh, and some of the changes that are going to be taking place in these areas as, um, you know, product that we can derive on a much wider scale. And from there, I just wanted to say thank you and open up the floor for questions. I know I kind of talked for a while there, but uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd like to take some time. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we have maybe five minutes for some questions. Uh, anyone faculty here or anyone online? I think we can also, Diana, are we also able to see questions in the chat? Yeah, hi, Susan. Is to see you have a, a quick question. Go ahead. It sounds like well, he, yeah. Yes, yes, this is he speaking. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I have a question for our students. Um, many of our, our students are interested into LiDAR, uh, airborne remote sensing, and looking at bathymetric data. For those students, would you uh, uh, point some useful data resources or educational tutorials they can they can play with. For example, you know, if they're interested into coastal erosion in California, are there any public available data they can play with? And what educational resources or programs they can learn? Thank you. Yeah, um, great question. Um, I will keep in contact with this group uh, through my points of contact. Darian and Susan to answer that because off the top of my head, um, I don't have <clears throat> a direct resource. I There's definitely resources out there that provide some of these updated point clouds through some of the national programs or statewide programs. 
where um, you can get updated raster products uh, from from these services, and some of them are built off of topo bathymetry. So uh, it exists. I can look into where to get direct um, provided point clouds. I know that all the stuff that we provide for NOAA is publicly available. Uh, it just depends on at what state you want to get it and just prepare yourself for a lot of data. Just to give you an idea, um, one flight can range from 250 to uh, 250 gigabytes to a terabyte of data, and then all of that has to be processed. And we have as much as for some of the NOAA projects, 100, 200 different flights. So data management is huge. And we reduce that from waveform to point cloud to classified point cloud to a raster product to, um, to shape files. And that makes the data much more managed when you probably want to get your hands on some of those downstream products. But um, yeah, there's, it, there's a lot of data involved with some of these collections. So um, let me get back to my points of contact with some some links that you can kind of look at some of these products. Thank you, that would be great. Some questions for me on the chat. Can you take some more? That question? Here we go. There are a couple more. Topo LiDAR and some topo bathymetry data is available. So somebody was sharing um, national map uh, downloading. Perfect. He asked a question. What are some of the early challenges you faced in calibrating the LiDAR? Ooh, to RTK points, and how did you approach developing a solution for this? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, so in best practices, uh, what we do is we try to maintain our control separate from the point cloud as much as we can and as far down the line as we can. So we'll take the data from the aircraft, which is trajectory information and point cloud information, we'll extract it all. And that's going to have offsets anywhere ranging from 10 centimeters to about a meter, meter and a half. And we'll tie those all together based off of what the trajectory is telling us. Uh, and then understanding how we extracted that trajectory to understand what frame and how off we are from the physical ground itself. Uh, because not only are you trying to extrapolate this data, but it all depends on also a bunch of the different frames you're working in. We have to work in sensor frame to um, aircraft frame, then create a point cloud based off of an ellipsoid. Then, you know, whether we're working between um, ITRF00, WGS84, and then how we get the control. We try to get it matching the control first and understand where all the errors could come into the data set relative to itself. Then we bring in the control on land and understand our offsets and how well we did there. Usually what we end up doing is we'll do a Z shift to control if it's under a certain amount and just understand what the standard deviation looks like to the control across the entire project. After we're satisfied with that, we will then take a look at um, the path of control points and bring those into the point cloud and understand how well we identified refraction. Or, or process refraction in some cases. Um, and, you know, there's different places where you can do refraction and all that all go, plays into the accuracy. So we'll do a couple of tests in different areas to what we understand to be the best, um, most accurate refraction possible. And then after we've calibrated everything, then we'll test it to control. Um, I hope that answers your questions. I think that those are all the variables that I can see at play here. Uh, but yeah, we tried to use a control as a check to the data instead of calibrating to it, you know, trying to just fit it into the control itself. Uh, it's very important to understand where all of the sensor errors and trajectory errors can come into play as we're doing that calibration, just to make sure we have a relative data set as accurate as possible. And then we like to test the control just to make sure we're uh, closing the loop correctly. Thank you for the questions and, and thank you for the continuing discussion, Andres. And we're going to, I'm sure, have lots of other 
uh, questions and opportunities with you. Our spatial data acquisition and faculty, I think, are taking lots of notes and, and we'll have, we have lots of opportunity for follow up. Um, so we have a, a double header of events this week. Uh, in addition to this great brown bag today, we have GIS Day tomorrow. Uh, we have a full slate of talks scheduled in the middle of the day, 11 to 1230. Uh, and then we have uh, student activities uh, led by our uh, SC members and our student teams later in the afternoon. All that information, hopefully you've already gotten by email and on, on flyers and, and our website. So we hope to see you all tomorrow for GIS Day. And please join me in thanking NB5 uh, Chase Fischel and Andres. Thanks. Thanks so much, guys. So, uh, thank Appreciate you. it. That was really great. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, well, We'll look forward to talking with you soon. Yep, sounds good. Okay. Take care.